Did you know that you could upgrade your main board by simply handing off all of the heavy calculations to a Raspberry Pi? Meet Clipper, and today we've got a guide for the Ender 3. Recently, I've been covering some upgrades to 32-bit main boards for 3D printing. If you want to know why this might be advantageous, I've got a primer on that that you might enjoy. I've also got a guide on the SKR version 1.3, which is proving to be one of the most popular, cheap 32-bit boards around. But what if you could improve your performance greatly with nothing more than a Raspberry Pi which you might already have? Normally when we 3D print, Marlin is on our main board, it processes a G-code and converts it into movement of the 3D printer. Traditionally, we introduce a Raspberry Pi with OctaPrint, but that's simply sending the G-code commands to Marlin for the same processing and movement to occur. Clipper is different. It offloads all of the heavy lifting to the Raspberry Pi, leaving the main board no calculations and the simplified task of controlling the hardware. Its main claim is very precise stepper motor timing, and that means a much higher ceiling in terms of speed. In this video, I'll be providing a guide to installing it on the Ender 3 and I've reverted my Ender 3 back to the factory main board with a BL Touch. There are other mods, but nothing that requires adjustment of the firmware. Without any further delay, let's get started with our setup. We start at clipper3d.org, and that's the launch page for this software. There's a link to the GitHub page where you can see all of the source, and most importantly, a link to the installation page, which will take us through step by step, and that's what I'm going to be following. Now a lot of this installation is done over the command line by directly talking to the Raspberry Pi. And on a Windows machine, there's a piece of software that makes that much easier. Connecting wirelessly to a Linux device is called SSH, and fortunately PuTTY is a free program to achieve just this. Once you download it, it's pretty simple to set up. You set it to SSH, you can leave the port at 22, and then you enter your local IP address. This is the location that you would access your Octoprint instance from in your web browser. After that, we simply click open. Our first job is to log in and the username will be Pi and hopefully you've changed your password from the default. Through my Windows computer, I'm now connected wirelessly to the file system of the Raspberry Pi. Everything has to be done via this terminal, so let's go through some commands that will help you out. Firstly, we have ls. That will list the contents of the current directory. Sometimes, however, we need to view some hidden files. ls space hyphen al will list all, including any hidden files. Anything in blue is a directory that we can go inside. The command cd is used to do this. Here we've told it to choose directory oprint, and when we hit enter, we'll see that the command line changes to tell us we're in that directory. If we want to go up one directory, it's cd gap dot dot. So we can see in the installation, our first step is to install Octopi because that's the image we need to run Octoprint. If you haven't done this, I've got a previous video on this and don't worry, it's super easy to do. We can also see that we need to be upgraded to the newest version, which when I log in, it tells me that I am. We're now up to our main scripts to start the process. To avoid errors, we can copy and paste, but it's slightly unusual. After we highlight our text in the browser, we can do Control C to copy and then in PuTTY, we simply right click to paste it in. Let's press enter to run this first command. Now that that's done, let's run the second line. Now you might have noticed before that command, it asked for my password, and that's because it ran a script with the sudo keyword, and that stands for super user. Think of it like an administrator that gives you greater privileges to change system files. Pseudo commands are very powerful, so just be careful every time you use them that you know exactly what you're trying to achieve. We can now continue with building and flashing the microcontroller. And normally we're used to doing this from the Arduino IDE and then flashing it via USB direct to the main board. For Clipper, we instead flash via USB directly from the Raspberry Pi. Now, funnily enough, I've just got an error for this not working and it says my display is too small. So I guess I have to go full screen with this and then run the command again. If you want to cycle through your previous commands, you can use up and down on the keyboard and that will get you back to them quickly. Because I'm doing this on an Ender 3, I think the obvious thing I need to change is my processor model. 
and the Ender 3 comes with an 18 mega 1284p. After this I'm going to come to exit. And yes, of course I will save my new configuration. Now we can simply type in make. Our firmware for the mainboard has been compiled into a hex file and just like Arduino, we now need to flash it. Instead of doing it from our computer, we're going to do it directly from the Pi. But first we need to find out the serial port. Let's copy this line and paste it in and when we hit enter, it should tell us our serial port. Our result down here is very similar to the example given in the instructions, so let's proceed. We now need to stop Clipper from running in the background. And then we're going to copy the front part of this line up to device equals. We're now going to highlight what was returned when we search for our serial port, come back to the green cursor and right click. That will paste our correct device into place and we should be able to hit enter to now flash to the main board. If you're having issues with that, please make sure that back in Octoprint that you're actually disconnected. We can now enter this line here to start up Clipper service again. Now in our instructions, we're going to edit a configuration file and we can do it via the command line in PuTTY, but I think I agree with the instructions when they suggest that it's easier to use a separate program. Therefore, we're going to use WinSCP. This is another free download and will let us connect to the file system of the Raspberry Pi, but present us with a graphical interface like Windows. So once we open WinSCP, it's very similar to PuTTY. We put in our IP address as the host name, leave the port number as 22, and then click Login. If you're doing it for the first time, you'll have this warning. That's perfectly fine, just click Yes. And then we need to enter our username and password, just like we did with PuTTY. The interface is as follows. On the left hand side of the screen, we have our Windows computer. And on the right hand side of the screen, we have the file structure of our Raspberry Pi. Back to our instructions, and we need to go to the config directory on GitHub and either start with the example configuration file, or since we're using an Ender 3, download that one. We can see in here that we have example configuration files for specific main boards. And then if we scroll further, we've got them set up for exact printers as well. So I'm gonna click on Ender 3, and then I'm gonna click on Raw, and then I should be able to go Control S and save this file to a special Clipper directory that I've set up. We can see it appears here, but we need to delete the .txt off the end. So we'll come to Rename, remove that, and now we can drag it over to the Pi directory. If we right click and come to Edit, we can see that all of the pin mappings inside the file are set up for our standard microcontroller of a 1284p and all of the hard work should have been done for us. If we scroll down, there's one more thing that needs to be set and that's our serial port. I've scrolled back up in PuTTY and I'm going to highlight the text, highlight here as well and then click Control V. We can now save this file. We can see in the instructions we need to rename the file to simply printer.cfg. So this will be our final step. We're going to right click, select rename, and then delete the end to leave printer.cfg. The file set up for our printer, and now having the correct file name, we can head back over to Octoprint and type in restart in the terminal. Now at this stage, it's probably worth mentioning there's an optional but easier way to control this by installing the Clipper plugin for Octoprint. If we search for Clipper in our plugin manager, we should find it very easily. With the plugin installed and Octoprint restarted, we now notice that we have some slightly different buttons here, but we also have a Clipper tab. Let's try a click status to begin, and these other options, we will explore those in time. Our base installation is now complete, and you might notice a new interface on your LCD screen. It has the usual options for heating, homing and moving, but now has commands for interacting with Octoprint from the printer, which is new and definitely cool. You should now verify that your configuration is correct by following the guidelines on the config check page. I found the pre-made configuration for the Ender 3 was spot on, so I undertook some PID tuning of the hot end. This was very easy because there was buttons set up for this inside the Octoprint plugin. One thing that I really like is that when you want to change the firmware configuration, you don't need to compile anything and flash it to the printer. 
You simply edit the file in WinSCP, save it, and restart Clipper through Octoprint. There's also a page on slicer settings for Clipper, but I found that there was nothing really relevant for me, apart from making sure that coasting was turned off. Now, if my printer was completely stock, I'd be ready to go, but remember, I've got that BL touch on, so let's have a look at how to set up for that. On the overview page, we'll see that partway down, there is a link for BL touch, and that's what we're going to follow. Back in WinSCP, we need to right click and edit our configuration file, because this is where we'll be putting the changes for the BL touch. The first thing we need to do is to copy and paste this line and insert it into our configuration file. We can see we're not meant to edit below this block, so let's put it underneath the display. Now, of course, we have to change which two pins that the BL touch is connected to. The control pin is usually pin 27, just like you use in a pin 27 board. If we look in our Arduino code for the Sanguino 1284P, we'll see that digital 27 is really called PA4. So that's what we're going to enter here, and that's consistent with the naming of the other pins throughout. Now the sensor pin is the one that plugs in where the Z end stop used to be, so we'll scroll up to that section. And here we can see it's PC4, so we will copy this, come back down and paste it over the top. Next up, under the Z axis, we need to tell it that the end stop pin is now a probe Z virtual end stop. So we'll copy this, head back up to that section and paste in this text over the top. Since we're using a BL touch, we also need to delete this line here, position underscore end stop. Now you notice we have a position max here. It's a good idea to also put in a position min. You might think this needs to be zero, but remember our probing results might be either side of zero. So something like minus one or minus 1.5 is a good idea. Now at this point, I'm going to deviate from these instructions because I found after a bit of testing, they leave some things out. A really useful document I found that's linked in the description is the example extras configuration file. As you can see, it has a much larger BL touch section with a lot more of the parameters that we can input. It's also worth noting that if you have a BL touch version 3 or 3.1 or a cloned BL touch, there's two extra parameters that you can experiment with to get them working correctly. With a Creality mainboard and a BL touch version 3, you still might need to move the resistor as outlined in my three fixes for BL Touch version 3 video. Over in my configuration file, you can see I've set up an X, Y, and Z offset. Just like with Marlin, you can measure the distance between the tip of the BL Touch and the nozzle with a ruler, or you can take it from the information provided when you download your mount. Now the Z offset initially, I would recommend leaving it zero. After a print starts, you can use the baby stepping menu from the LCD on your printer to lower it down until you have the perfect first layer squish. Even though that number will likely be a minus, enter it here under Z offset as a positive. The last parameter I bought over was the pin move time. I found the default of 0.675 a little bit slow, so I dropped mine to 0.4. To show you how I calculated my min and max points for the mesh, I've made this little diagram. Now in Marlin, we put in our probe offsets and the boundaries of the grid, and it will work out the rest for us. But in Clipper, we have to do it manually. For my Hero Me mount, my nozzle is here, and my BL touch is 10 millimeters to the front and 45 to the left. And that's why we need to have safe homing on because when the nozzle is at zero, zero, the BL touch will be hanging over the edge, miss the bed as Z goes down, therefore making a collision. I find it easiest to start with calculating the max position. If we move the nozzle the whole way to the back corner of the bed at 235, 235, we can see that our BL touch will be minus 45 from there and 10 in from the rear edge. Therefore, we'll calculate our max point as 235, 235. Now this is the type of probing grid that I'm aiming for. It's gonna zigzag starting in the left-hand corner and eventually ending up in the right rear-hand corner. You'll notice here that mine is symmetrical. Therefore, I need to know that when the BL touch is lined up with this front corner that's symmetrical to my rear corner, the nozzle is actually further over to the right than you might expect. We know the distance to the edge is symmetrical to this one at 45, and we know that our mount adds a further 45, therefore our X is 90, and we have a similar case on the Y, a 10 gap with a 10 offset to equal 20. Therefore, for the Hero Touch BL Touch mount, suggested for clipper min and max values are 90, 20, and 235, 235. The next section I have here is called G-Code Macro. 
and we need this because Clipper doesn't use G29 like Marlin for auto bed leveling. Instead, it uses a command called bed mesh calibrate. Fortunately, we can simply enter G code underscore macro followed by G29 and then our G code with indented bed mesh calibrate. And every time we enter a G29, Clipper knows that it wants us to run this command instead. Our final piece of the puzzle is safe homing. And there's some suggested code to add to the configuration file to manually program the print head to move up 10 millimeters to a specific spot and then home the Z separately. When I tried this, however, I found that even when I entered a G28XY, which should be safe to use in NG code because it doesn't home the Z axis, the entire homing procedure took place and therefore the print head would come down and attempt to crush what I just printed. I found elsewhere in the docs that we could declare safe Z home with a couple of key parameters. My home position is 155, 120, and that's using that same offset system to move the BL touch into the very center of the bed. The speed to move there is 80 millimeters per second. It'll lift up 10 millimeters before doing so at a speed of 10 millimeters per second. You can see I have all of this commented out, but since I no longer need it, I'm now going to delete it. The end result of all of this is the safe homing occurring in the very middle of the print bed and then a 3x3 symmetrical grid of BL touch probing before printing commences. And this has ensured that my first layers have gone down perfectly in a consistent and repeatable way. So with that, I finally had the BL touch working. And although it's convenient to have all of its parameters in one place in that configuration document, it was kind of frustrating having to reference so many other places to find out what I needed. The last thing that I like to cover in this video is called pressure advance. And fortunately, it's a lot easier to set up. So let's have a look at how that's done. Pressure advance is called linear advance in Marlin and it aims to do two things. It reduces ooze during non-extrude moves and it reduces blobbing during cornering. To set it up in Clipper, we need to download a square STL file and tune our slicer to print it at 100 millimeters per second with a layer height of 0.3 on an end of three and a low infill of 10%. In our configuration file, under the extruder section, we need to add the lines pressure underscore advance and set it to zero, and pressure underscore advance underscore look ahead underscore time and set it to 0 0.010. From the documents, we'll now copy and paste some parameters into the terminal in Octoprint. Now that we've done that, we can run our first version of the square. After printing one, we can then repeat the last line of code to change the pressure advance number. The instructions suggest starting at 0.05, printing again and repeating this until you get good results. So what are good results? Well, we're inspecting the corners on these and you'll find that there's a little bulge on the worst ones and the better ones have a nice crisp edge and a nice sharp angle. We can also look for the same thing on these little internal directional changes. For further reference, there's a really nice set of diagrams on the pressure advance page of their documentation. If you're having trouble finding a value that works, there are some important notes on the document for pressure advance. Typically, the number will be higher on a Bowden extruder, but I'm using direct drive, so mine was only 0.06. One other thing is that despite setting it to zero for our testing, we should return our pressure advance look ahead time back to 0.01. When we have our final results, we can update them in the main configuration. And then when we save this file and restart the Clipper service, they will remain persistent for future prints. With my limited testing, the printer seems to be performing well. And some things do seem a bit strange to me, but we have to remember that I'm mainly used to Marlin and you're gonna have some inevitable bias there. In the next video, we're gonna have a follow-up on Clipper and we're gonna look at doing some different hardware such as TMC stepper motor drivers. The other thing we're going to test is this print hat from Rec Labs. It's a purpose-made board to go with your Raspberry Pi so you don't even need the factory mainboard from the printer. At this point to me, Clipper seems a bit like an acquired taste. So I'd love to hear from you if you've tried it and how you found the results to be. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.